Hello, um, my name is Taylor Meyer. The topic that I chose to give my presentation over is how genes and genomes evolve. This covers chapter nine in the textbook. So I thought I'd give a little bit of background. Um, this is what I would teach or what I hope students would understand before um, we went into this lesson. So hopefully students would understand the difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic organisms. Um, they would also have an understanding of the basic structure and function of DNA. And I hope that they would understand the process of gene expression. So the objectives for this lesson are to compare DNA sequences of modern organisms to um, the first single celled organism to kind of see how we have evolved. Um, the second one would be to compare the genomes of different humans of different populations to see how genetically similar we all are. And then um, to define how mutations drive this change in evolution and to explain how mutations can cause differences between individuals in a specific population. So kind of the importance of these objectives. So what these objectives do is they provide an insight into the very first living beings and to also show how we have evolved since the first single cell organisms or how life has evolved in general. Um, also, um, talking about how all humans are connected, I believe that it allows for deeper conversations of how we're all connected to one another. Um, so this could be taken from a religious standpoint. So um, if I was teaching at a religious college such as Grand Canyon, maybe I would have a discussion about um, how our genetic similarity relates to the Christian worldview where God sees us all as his uh, sons and daughters. Um, but then also it can lead into a conversation about race and skin color and how we're not so different from each other, yet we have these very strong prejudices. So I would also potentially lead into um, lessons that go over those types of topics or ask questions about those types of topics. Um, so, and then also, I think it's important to uh, talk about how these changes occur or how these changes um, or what these changes are. They are mutations and mutations have driven those changes that we see amongst individuals in a population, but also between different species. And then just kind of overall in general. So uh, this may be the very last class students take um, in their educational careers. Um, I would focus this lesson on undergraduate students. So um, this, they may not ever take another science class again in their lives. And so my um, ideals as an educator currently and um, as I continue to progress my educational career, I would want, I want students to um, find passion in science. That happened for me um, when I came into college. So I would hope to inspire that in others. And so the reason I chose this topic is because I feel like it's very relevant. It's relevant to who we are. It's relevant to our current climate and past climate. And so um, that is why I chose this lesson. So how I would introduce the topic to undergraduate students is I found this really interesting TED talk. It's called How to Read the Human Genome and Build a Human Being. So what this video does is it dives deeper into the human genome and includes how genetically similar humans are to one another. Um, it also discusses how these changes were brought on by mutations, which is also covered in the topic that I'm going over. Um, I would use this topic to introduce the topic of genetic similarities between humans and other organisms. So that's what I would initially start off with. And then kind of moving into um, the where humans evolved from in the first place. So um, thinking back, Charles Darwin, when he first proposed that humans evolved from a common ancestor as chimpanzees, um, for lack of a better term, people were absolutely disgusted. So imagine how they would feel nowadays if they were alive today, now that scientists have discovered that actually our common ancestor is more primitive than chimpanzees. It's actually a single celled organism. So we all descended from a single celled organism that and when I say we I mean um, us, the cat on the street, you know, your dog, fish, 
all of these different types of things, the trees outside, we all descended from a common ancestor. Sometimes this is called, uh, or this is commonly referred to as LUCA, which is the last universal common ancestor. Um, by looking at DNA, they were able to discover that LUCA is about 3 billion years old, and what it mostly resembled is a prokaryotic organism. So since uh, LUCA was a single-celled organism and had to survive in extreme environments, it shows similarities to both archaea and bacteria. Um, it was ultimately confirmed when evolutionary biologists studied the DNA of modern bacteria and archaea and found that there are 355 similar gene families between archaea and bacteria. This shows that they descended from a common ancestor and sort of backs up that idea that LUCA even existed. So there are three domains of life, archaea, bacteria, and eukarya. Each domain has the same four nucleotides, okay? Um, the first one of these is adenine, um, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. There are also 23 proteins that can be found in all three domains of life. Um, with these similarities, um, we that basically backs up the idea that we all share a common ancestor, and it's often used as proof or evidence that um, LUCA existed. So human's closest relative. So Charles Darwin was correct in his assumption that chimpanzees and humans have a common ancestor. And not only that, but we are 99% genetically similar to chimpanzees. So out of the 3 billion nucleotides that make up human DNA, only 15 million of those 3 billion are different from chimps. So this 1% difference um, leads to many phenotypic differences because oftentimes we don't look at chimpanzees and say, yeah, I look just like that. Um, so a lot of those differences are held within that 1% of DNA difference. Um, so while the difference between humans and chimps is low, um, the difference is about 1%. Um, and think about how different we look from one another. So if we look at humans and the difference between the, us and any other human on the street is actually about a 0.1% difference in DNA. Um, this is equivalent to about one of every 1,000 nucleotides being different between us and another person. Um, this difference, you know, we all look at each other and we're, you know, an array of different colors, heights, um, genders, all of that different stuff. And that difference is accounted um, for that 0.1% and um, just kind of interesting to think about. So the phenotypic differences between individuals, while the variation in genes between two humans is very small, um, here are some of the examples that we commonly see um, that explain those differences. So one of these examples is eye color. So approximately 10 different genes account for the different shades of blue, brown and green that we see in human eyes. Um, height is another that can vary. So the difference between one individual and another is between 700 different genetic variations. So height and eye color out of the 3 billion, um, there's not very many genes out of that 3 billion. If you take that into, into view, there's not very many differences, yet it accounts for such um, discrepancies between people. So differences in populations. So this is something that I found incredibly interesting. So after the Human Genome Project map out the human genome, there was a debate about this similarity between different human populations. So for example, if we were looking at a population in Asia and a population in Europe, how genetically similar are they? Um, and so scientists looked into that con concept and tested out that concept. So what it was discovered is that actually, individuals between populations such as that um, are more genetically similar or in some cases um, than that of individuals within each population so for example um, what it showed is that the study concluded that 377 microsatellite loci and about 1000 individuals showed that 38 percent of the time 
Asian population shared a higher genetic similarity to European populations than they did to their own population. So kind of interesting to think about. You would, a lot of times it's expected to be different, but you're actually in some cases more genetically similar to a completely different population um, than what you look like or what you're a part of. So the main driving force between that difference is uh, mutations. So the driving factor in diversity among all organisms even organisms of the same species are mutations. These types of mutations will drive, or the, the main types of mutations that will drive um, chains, change is germline mutations, or in other words, mutations that can be inherited. Um, so in humans, um, these types of changes would have to happen in sex cells. So in sperm or an egg. Um, if mutations can be inherited, then they can lead to a higher species diversity. Um, this is because um, those mutations eventually through um, multiple lines of pedigrees um, can actually spread out through a population and tr drive change within a population. While some of these mutations can be beneficial, some can be neutral, some can be harmful, or um, they can be any combination of the three. So for example, sickle cell anemia is an example of this. So sickle cell anemia is harmful in general, um, but um, it can actually be beneficial. So what sickle cell anemia does is it actually causes a mutation or a deformation of the red blood cell. But what it can also do is cause a resistance to malaria. So in that case, it is beneficial. And what malaria is, is it's a parasite um, and, and it can wreak havoc on the body. So it would be beneficial in areas where that type of um, parasitic infection is more prevalent. Um, it would be beneficial to have sickle cell anemia. And that's actually what they find is in those populations, um, sickle cell anemia is actually more prevalent. Um, so mutation drives evolutionary chains, absolutely. So evolutionary or evolution is a change in a population over an ex extended period of time. Um, these changes are often brought on by mutations where the change in DNA is passed through germline cells. So basically it's inherited. When the mutation is advantageous, it is more likely to be passed on because that organism is more likely to, to survive and reproduce. Um, as time passes, the mutation can come more frequent in a population where it may eventually lead to a new species. Um, it's important to note that that type of change is typically not caused by a single mutations, a mutation, but a um, variety of different mutations that um, can kind of accumulate and then cause that type of change. If I was to teach this lesson further, where I would take this topic or where I would expand this topic is onto the biology of human skin color. I think that this would be a great end to talking about race and how um, we have these prejudices, um, but there's no backing or genetic backing to that. So um, I linked here a video about the biology of human skin color. Um, I also linked an article that talks about it from Scientific American. And then also, I also linked an article about different types of mutations and um, the harm, harm, beneficial, and um, potentially neutral uh, outcomes that can come from these types of mutations. Um, I also linked my resources down below um, for anybody that is curious as to uh, where I got my information from. Um, other than that, um, it was great having this time with you guys. Um, please let me know if you have any questions about this topic. Uh, I'm very interested in it. So if you would like to know more, please let me know. Thank you so much.